So you've probably seen some HDR photos shared by real estate photographers on social media and looking at them, you might think they're too good to be true. Well, you're probably right because a lot has really changed when it comes to HDR photography. It's not what it used to be. It's something that I call the HDR myth and I realize that you're probably thinking, well, since I use Flambient, since I'm a proponent of Flambient, that I'm gonna be biased against HDR, but I'm actually gonna show in this episode where it could be used. But more importantly, what I'm gonna do in this episode is I'm gonna pull back the curtain to really show what's going on with today's modern HDR because it is a lot different. When we think of HDR, when I first probably mentioned that in this episode, you were probably thinking of the automated HDR, which would be using like Photomatix, or it'd be using Aurora or Affinity, Infuse, maybe Lightroom's Merge or Photoshop. That's all a thing of the past. It's very rare nowadays to find editors that are just doing that automated HDR approach because it just doesn't get you very good results. There's a lot of work that goes into it. So there are new techniques that are being used today and that's what I'm gonna pull back the curtain on with a couple different examples. The first example that I'm gonna show would be something that would be typically shared on social media because it's very easy to do using modern HDR. I'm gonna compare that to using Flambient. I'm gonna go into a more difficult one for the modern HDR and it would be especially difficult for automated HDR and also compare that to Flambient as well. Now, while there will be some quality differences between all of these comparisons, there's something bigger at stake here when it really comes down to the HDR myth and that's the one about time. Today, most HDR photographers don't do their own editing and the reason is, is because they can't to the level that they would want to get the quality for the amount of time they would have to spend to be able to get this look out of using the modern HDR techniques. So instead, what a lot of these photographers, the HDR photographers are doing is going on site, capturing the pictures, and then just offloading everything they do to outsourcing. So they outsource this to then overseas editors and they put a time burden on them instead of themselves. We're using a lot of these modern HDR techniques. As you'll see, as I walk through what these techniques are, they can take more time than using Flambient overall. So what this does, it leads to an illusion that's part of this HDR myth that HDR today is still much faster than Flambient and you can get similar results. But as I'm gonna show in these examples, that's not necessarily true because if you were to take everything all encompassing here, there's a greater effort. Now, it doesn't mean that you're gonna choose one or the other. It just means that you have to be aware of the HDR myth and make a decision based on what you're doing, how you want to approach this because there will be some differences and there are reasons why I use the Flambient technique. So let's dive into doing some of this editing to give you enough information so that you can make an educated decision on not just if you should use Flambient or HDR, but when you might wanna use them and for what. So here's our first example and we're gonna do it both ways. We're gonna do it in Flambient and then we're gonna do it in the modern HDR. So to get a comparison, let's do the Flambient first. And you can see here, this is the typical setup using the same exact workflow and settings and everything that I show within my books and also in my online course. And here we've got first our uh, ambient shot and then we've got a flash shot. And you can see here immediately, well, we've got control of our colors because we reduce the exposure so that we're not seeing all the ambient light, or at least not much of it. Anyways, as we move through then, all we needed to do was to capture a couple window poles to get the view outside. I know these may look a little odd, but we're gonna use these to get that outside view very quickly. So just as typical, we're gonna open these after applying the pre-processing preset, which is really just nothing more than lens correction. We're gonna open these as layers in Photoshop. So typical to the workflow after opening them, we've got our uh, ambient shot at the top. Our flash shot is underneath of that ambient layer. Then we've got the window poles down here. But all we need to do to do flambient blending is just do the typical 50-50. And I applied the action to do that, which is nothing more than just changing it to luminosity blending mode in a 50% opacity. We'll bump that up a little bit though, and let's change that opacity down to about 60%. So that gives us a nice looking image. Basically at this point, we're done. 
all of our editing was done unless we want to get the window views. Now, if all we had was this type of window over here, you could call it a day, there's no view, and you could just go ahead and finish and put on your final bump. But either way, you'd be done. In this case, to get those outside views, we've got the luxury of using these window poles. So the first one I'm gonna use is this one down here. And if you've never seen this before, I know this looks really odd being over flashed there, but what this allows us to do is by taking this up to the very top, turning that into then darken mode and adding a layer mask. Now what I can do is I can go over here to this window and using a brush, and I'll just use, uh, let's say a 100% uh, opacity, we'll use about a 30% flow, and I can then tap this in. Look at how I'm overlapping onto the frame. That's because this is a darken mode window pull. So I don't have to worry about how I'm gonna overlap. There's no cutting in windows, which we're gonna get to here in a second doing the HDR. Let's zoom back out here. Now the other window pull I did over here was just for this window here. The first one was for that window. So I'm going to take this also up to the top and I'm going to change it into dark and blending mode and then layer mask hide. And I can get real sloppy here. I'll take a polygon tool, which I selected here, and I'll just go anywhere around this window. Look, I'm not going inside the windows. And then if I reverse my colors here to black and white instead of white and black by pressing X, press the delete key on the keyboard, press X to revert my colors and control D to deselect, you can see that the window pull is there. And that's basically done. Now there's a little bit of glare here from the flash and I might be able to fix that using this one here. So I could go back to my other window pull even and just tap a little bit of that in on that end. But you can see now that is basically done. So now all that we do is typical flatten the image and then we'll be going back to Photoshop. But there's something important here to realize with using this particular method of doing the window pulls using flash compared to if you were to use HDR. And I'll revisit this in a second, but let's take a look at this example, which has a lot of little panes of windows all over the place. Now, if you had to use the darken mode window pull like I just did, it's easy. You flash it, you just anywhere around here, you draw a polygon or use a brush. You don't have to worry about overlapping onto these panes. That's going to be a pain when we get into doing HDR. Anyways, let's get this other one wrapped up first. And to do that, all we would do is flatten it, just go to layer, and then at the bottom there's flatten image. When you save it, it'll be back into Lightroom. And then in here, you would just apply one of your final post-processing presets, like this one here, which you can see is really nothing more than adding a little bit of contrast, dropping some of the highlights up in the shadows, a little bit of whites down the blacks, a little bit of clarity, and then you would just adjust this as you see fit. And then maybe two, since I shot really wide, got the handle of that refrigerator in there, I'll just crop it down to about there. So anyways, this image is done and that's all there was to do flambient. So now let's do the modern HDR technique that would compete against this. To do that, over here, all that you need is just a bracket of three shots. This works almost every single time, but in the second example that I'll show, you're probably gonna have to get a little bit more footage. So here we've got a normally exposed image. You can see here we're exposing to the right. Then you would go two stops darker, get this, and most of the time that'll get you some window view, but like I said, second example will show a little something different. And then we go two stops brighter. Now, this will help fill in some of the shadows. It'll give us the dynamic range that we want, and that's all you really need using the modern techniques. So here, before blending these, you would typically tweak these just a little bit. So for instance, here, we might wanna tweak the white balance a little bit. You know, you could try sampling off of the ceiling over here to see what uh, is going on, but that's probably a little too much. So let's just back that out, and let's go down to about, let's say, 4,000 Kelvin here, and then and maybe, uh, maybe about 10 on the tint, and that looks pretty good. So that means we'd wanna also change that when it comes to our other exposure here. So we'll go down to 4,000. 10. And the reason why we're doing this right now is because it can be difficult working with ambient images to really get the correct white balance because there's a lot of other color temperatures, a lot of other light sources throughout the space. So anyways, next thing we'd wanna do is adjust anything for our highlights and shadows. So when we take a look at what we're going to use here to extend our dynamic range, it's a little on the hot side. So let's just take down our highlights, take down some of our whites a little bit, and maybe also 
also just the exposure just a tad, not much, because you'll see why in just a second. Next, you take all three of those images and you would open those as layers in Photoshop. So now we've got our three exposures loaded and what you want to do is have your brightest one all the way at the top. And then what you do is with that selected, you go to the channels tab. Do control click on RGB or command click if you're on a Mac and then go back to layers. What you've done is you've selected in the tonal range where highlights would be at about 50% of that range. Anyways, it's most of the highlights is all that that means. So now what you can do is just add a layer mask, but this next step is very important. What you want to do, and this is what most real estate photography editors do now for this modern type of HDR, is you want to feather this selection by a large amount. So you go up to select, modify, and then you want to feather this by about, let's say, 150 pixels. Then what you do is just add a layer mask, and you can do that by clicking this little icon down here, and you can see now we've got something that is a better blend. So this is without it, this helped fill it in. If we used all of it, it had been too bright. So now you can control how much of this should be shown. And to do that, there's a couple ways, but I'm gonna show you the most efficient. Before we get to that, we do have some color issues that we're gonna correct later. And to make this streamlined, it's best right now to put in a hue saturation layer. So we'd go to layer, adjustment layer, and then hue saturation. Don't worry about it. We're gonna come back and visit that later. You'll see why in a second. We wanna go down now to that layer that we used, which was our brightest one, and place that in a group. So what you can do is right click and say group from layers. Okay, now add a layer mask. So layer mask reveal all. Now you can decide where you don't want so much of that ambient. Let's zoom out a little bit and let's just erase some of that ambient maybe around here. Right? And using about a 30% flow, we've got now control over how much ambient. But what we're doing is we're doing this in a more controlled fashion because we already have a head start using our luminosity mask down here. So now we've got something that's starting to blend fairly well. Okay, now with this to where our desired type of exposure and dynamic range is, now we can add the windows. And this becomes the difficult part using this method. What we wanna do is bring our windows all the way up to the top, even above the hue saturation layer that we're going to be using, and then just layer mask hide. Now the easy part, we'll go in over here, and this is typical of these tutorials online, is that there's nothing obstructing the windows. We'll take a polygon tool, and you wanna overlap just a little bit onto the frame, not much, because what we're gonna do is modify this selection. So let's do that. And then we'll go over here and do the same thing. Now, a lot of uh, editors will use the pen tool. I really don't care for that as much as polygon. It's really just a preference. But anyways, with that, I've got the polygon selected. Now, what you wanna do is contract this by two pixels. So you go to select, modify, and then contract by two pixels. Then you wanna feather this by two pixels. So you go to select, modify, and then feather by two pixels. Then reversing your colors over here to black and white instead of white and black by pressing X, press delete, and then revert your colors back and press control D to deselect. Now we've still got a little bit of an outline here and I could have perhaps uh, feathered that a little better or drawn that in a little bit better, but it's all a matter of how close you can get to that edge and feathering it. You can even change the opacity of that layer just a little bit if you don't need it, but we'll change that back to 100%. Now the hard part here is when we get over to this area. So you could try to use a quick selection tool, whatnot, but the best thing is to go back down here to your base layer, go to channels, do a control click again on the RGB channel, and that'll start selecting things that are highlighted. If you do control alt shift click in there, then what you have is a little bit more of a refinement. So go back here to layers, go back up here to the window layer, and with a brush at about a 30% flow, you can start tapping in some of that. And it helps protect somewhat of the edges, but you can see it's not doing it 100%. So what we need to do is like use the quick selection tool to go in here and select the cabinet, press delete to delete that. We might want to use a polygon tool, for instance, to uh, edit out this beam here in the windows. 
where we've got part of the frame that's just looking muddy because it overlapped too much. You can delete that if you wanted to, or just select it and maybe just erase a little bit out of it, however you want. Um, but you have to start selecting and playing around with this. Now you can just take the eraser and just kind of erase some of it around here and grab the whole thing. So it's not that critical of a window here, but if you have a critical view that you're trying to see, then this becomes much more difficult. So that's one problem. And once again, if we go back and revisit the other other situations. This would be just a nightmare to try to do cutting this all out using this technique. Now, there's some speedy ways to be able to edit some of this out and delete it using the eraser tool and shift clicking from end to end, but it's something that's just very difficult overall to do. So it's not something that I would really recommend. That's why darken mode window pulls come in so handy using the flambient method. But getting back here, let's say that I did even a better job of cutting these windows out. Well, we still have some issues of our color. We can see that it looks actually green up here compared to what the color should be here. And there's kind of an orange cast that's on the cabinets. This is where that hue saturation layer comes in. So what we'll do is we'll double click on the properties icon. We'll just move this out of the way for a second and use this little trick here. You click on this little hand right here. And then with that little hand selected, you do a click drag. And when you start dragging that, you can see what that's doing. It's desaturating the colors that it detected. In this case, look down here on the properties, you'll see that was the yellows. So I click in here and I can move that back and forth. Now it's desaturating all the yellows in here, but we can control that. Do that in a second. The other thing is we got a lot of blues and red on the floor down here because we relied on ambient light. So once again, I can click here and just drag that to the left. You can see it was desaturating the blues. Now I'm doing this below the windows, so I'm not affecting the windows. You wouldn't want to do this to your final image. That's why you do it now. Now it desaturated too much, so you would, on the mask, select the eraser tool, and then you would just erase where you didn't want all that to be. Maybe a little bit over the, uh, the island here, we erase some of that over here, and maybe a little bit more over here on the dishwasher, around the sink, um, definitely over here uh, around the backsplash. We don't want to lose the orange necessarily there. So you're in control then of how much of this you want to show through, but the idea is you have to now do these color corrections to get rid of these various color casts coming through. Now there's other methods you can do to get rid of color casts, and I can show those in other tutorials if you want. But the idea is here is that working with just these three images, you can keep one that's gonna work your windows, you have one that's then filling in the shadows, and then you have to do your color corrections. Now once this is done and you're happy with it, then of course you'd flatten it. But we can make further adjustments by saying, yeah, we've got too much ambient now that we can see everything going on. So let's just erase a little bit more of that ambient in some of these places where it really wasn't doing us you know, any favors, um, especially around the windows here because that was also causing that real dark line to show up and maybe even here. Okay, so once that's done, once again, we'll just flatten this layer, flatten image, save it. And now it's back in Lightroom. So we'll do some final adjustments. We'll just add that a typical preset to it. It's a little hot, so we'll just maybe lower the exposure just a little bit. And then we'll also do a similar crop, bringing it down here from the right, get those handles of the refrigerator out. So that's probably a pretty good finished image. So let's compare the two. So over here on the left, we can see this is using Flambient with a darkened mode window pole. And on the right, this was using the modern HDR technique. Now, some stuff really stands out. You can see that if we were to zoom in down here, we can have a definitely a, a different type of color cast. We can see there's issues here with using the modern HDR because we couldn't get rid of all the ambient light and do it safely where when we were on the flash shot, that was easy to do. So using Flambient, we can get rid of color casts much more quickly. The colors do look matching overall, but with the modern HDR, we did still have to make some special color adjustments where using Flambent, you just fire flash and you got that taken care of. 
Also, the windows will come out cleaner, and sure, I could have done a better job of cutting in those windows, not leaving this border around there, but that's just a lot more work, where the amount of effort to get a window pole out of using darkened mode window poles with Flambit, it's a piece of cake. There's nothing to it. And I can do it for any window. It doesn't matter if something's blocking it or not. I can just get a better view and get it instantaneously. So those are the differences, but still overall, the HDR image really isn't that bad. It doesn't look like the HDR of old where you'd have all these weird shadows and, and weird colors everywhere. We're allowed to control that, but this really is the same technique that we've been using for years as real estate photographers to do architectural work for very large spaces. Like this, this was in a condo amenity I shot here some time back, and I had probably 10 minutes before other people were gonna start walking in and through this place, so I don't have time to set up lights, and you know what, it's just more work offline to be able to do it, but not much time on site to do it. Now I'm doing my own editing, of course, yes, it did take me longer to edit than if I had done Flambient, but I could be in and out of that property in just a few minutes, so that's why this was done. Another one here, was similar. You know, yeah, I've got a lot more warmth over here and I could add some color correction layers, but getting the lucky time where there's one or two minutes where no one's gonna be walking through, doing condo amenities, you can get away with this. Now, if this was for a builder or a designer, they wouldn't be happy with the sconce blown out. They wouldn't like the colors that are showing up here underneath the beam. They want me to correct a lot more. So there's a lot more effort that would have to go into it where, if this was for a builder, well, I'd be bringing in some lights, probably in umbrellas, and I would be able to get really good, correct, and sharp colors, and that and ambient onto it in luminosity mode, so I've got that flambient blend. And the same goes here. This isn't the best looking image, because this was using modern HDR, but I only had a couple minutes. It was a lucky break. While people, we actually had them move out of there for just a second, just let the photographer take a quick picture, and I gathered enough frames to make this work. But here inside of this house, looking out to the golf course, I don't have to worry about the window views, even though this other stuff is blocking the view. I don't have to worry about cutting around a chair, cutting around little things like this. It doesn't matter if something's blocking the view because when it comes to darken mode window pulls, you flash it and forget it. That's it. It just comes out naturally in post. Anyways, let's take a look at this second example. Here's the finished flambient blended image with a darken mode window pull. And the, once again, this window could also be cut out. That's not the bigger problem here. The bigger problem is when we take a look at the ambient and actually see what was involved. So this had what I call great light disparity. And what we've got is a huge difference between it and what the views outside would be, for instance, like here. So the difference when we're taking a look at something like this is we're taking a look at about one-tenth of a second to get an ambient shot compared to one one-sixtieth of a second to see outside. That's like four full stops to be able to get enough exposure difference between them. But this can still be done using this HDR method. We're just going to get a different type of result. So what you can do is like in this case, we're going to take a few, a couple different ambient shots and we're going to take the window pull shot and we're going to bring those as layers into Photoshop. So you can see here, I've got our really bright shot, and here would be our more exposed image. And of course, to get this, sometimes you have to tweak those a little bit in Lightroom. That's not a big deal, feel free to do that. But what you want here, as you can see, this is kind of exposing to the right, and then our bright image here will be able to fill in some of the shadows. So we use the same technique by going to Channels, doing Control click on RGB, going back to Layers, Feathering that by going to Select, Modify, Feather, bring that up to about 150 pixels, and then add a layer mask. So now we've got something that's got a bit better dynamic range. We can see by shutting that on and off or seeing all of it. So we've got a pretty good mix. Once again, we're gonna make some uh, color adjustments. So right now is a good time so it doesn't get mixed up in your group to go to Layer, Adjustment Layer, and then add that Hue Saturation Layer, and we'll touch that later. Anyways, back down here to our bright exposure, we want to put that into a group and then we want to go layer mask and then reveal all. And then we can decide to erase some of this, this brighter stuff here that we want to. So we can say that, well, it's a little bit too bright there, was it? Well, we can erase that or we can brush that back in. We'll brush that back in. And do we need something a little more lighter down underneath of it? 
Well, we can see it without that, with it. Well, maybe we need to add a little bit more light. So going back and forth, you can decide to add and subtract as much as you want. If there was a little too much uh, brightness here, don't delete it here. It's best to delete it off of that group mask. So here, for instance, around the window, we'll just delete all this around the window. So we don't need all that amount of uh, bright ambient that's coming in there. So we can control that. Going into the far room too, that's really hot. So we'll just take an eraser and tap some of that out. And once again, I'm using this mask up here on top of the luminosity mask. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. And I can do that over here around the window. So we can really tone that down. You can see we're getting somewhat decent results out of this. So not bad, not exactly like what we were up against, but it's a little bit better than if we tried to do some automated blending with it. And do we need anything brighter? Let's take a look, maybe a little bit more than over here. So you go back and forth deciding where this needs to be, where this needs to be balanced. Okay, now the windows. We'll take the window shot, bring that all the way up to the top, layer mask hide. We'll do the same cutting in technique where I'll use a polygon and it'll get really close up here, maybe just a little bit of overlap onto the frame itself. Then we come down here, over here, double click by the way closes that. Let's just go out here. We'll modify that by doing our select modify contraction of two pixels, select modify feather by two pixels. And then with our black and white colors, not white and black, we press delete on the keyboard, reverse our colors, control D to deselect. So just like we did before, didn't mean to rush through that, but you can see there's our window. But once again, it didn't have any obstructions. So that made it easy. So now comes the trickier part for this window. So there's a lot we can do, a lot of different techniques. Let's for instance say that we wanted to use the quick selection tool. Well, that did a pretty good job getting around that uh, faucet. And now we can take a brush with a low flow and maybe start tapping in some of that to get some of that view to come back. But you can see I'm still overlapping onto things. So I'd need to use like the polygon tool or something else to like select some of this, try to delete it, maybe brush some of it out. Another trick too you can do, and I mentioned it in the last one, is if you take an eraser, and we'll take this eraser and make it about the size of this part of the window frame. Take it to 100% flow and go up here and just right in the middle, go click, go down to the bottom and go shift click, and it makes a straight line of an erase. So anyways, that's probably not too bad for that type of uh, window view. We don't need to have it clear. We can see here, do we wanna maybe add a little bit more in there, add or delete anything off of there? Let's say that's just fine. So now let's do our color corrections. And we'll zoom out just a little bit so we can get a better view. We'll double click on the properties of our hue saturation leader, grab our little hand tool, and then we'll go click, drag to the right, and you can see now we're getting rid of all that orangey hues. That was actually in the yellows. A Little bit of blue is also coming in off the chairs right here, so we could also do a shift, excuse me, a click and drag, and it's getting rid of some of those blues automatically. And then you can see because we're now desaturating the floors, we're desaturating the uh, cabinets, well, we just take an eraser tool and we erase some of that off. So we'll use an eraser at let's say about a 30% flow and then tap some of that so that it comes back. We're erasing then from the mask. So we've got better control of what's going on there. So that would be probably pretty good. We could see with or without it. Did we lose too much color? Yeah, we lost probably too much out here at desaturated. So that's good. If it's desaturated too much overall, you can always change then its opacity. Let's change that down to about 80%, maybe about 90%. And let's say that that's pretty good. So this is without the color correction, this is with it. Okay, then the same thing is we're gonna go to layer flatten and save it so that it goes back into Lightroom. So here we can once again, apply a typical uh, post-processing bump and that's not looking too bad. Could make a few other adjustments to it so that's not quite so glary, doesn't look so unrealistic. Soften it up just a little bit, maybe take out some of those blacks. So now let's compare that to our flash flambient shot. So I've cropped these both down to be the same so we can go back and forth. And we can see once again, we have here on the left, we have the flambient shot. And that really wasn't that difficult to do using flash. 
you can see the benefit of using flash. It just looks overall to be a much sharper, more professional looking image. And we can do some pixel peeping to go in here and see some of those differences. For instance, if we go in here, you can see the cabinet color is accurate. This is the uh, flashed flambient over here, the flambient shot on the left. And over here, this is the uh, HDR, modern HDR. And you can see that even the color of the wood over here, it's got too much of a green cast that came in from the outside. It just doesn't match the rest of the cabinets. And we can see that by looking at these other cabinets. Now, those cabinet colors are consistent across the board on the flambient shot. Looking underneath the cabinets, we can also see some differences. These fluorescent lights, this over here, once again, this is the HDR using nothing but ambient. So we're getting a green cast coming off those fluorescent lights. And it is softer by nature because we're relying on all ambient. So that's why we've got this little bloom that's peeking out over top of, well, underneath of the cabinets. And if we move along these counters, we can see all kinds of color differences, even down here in the reflections just a world of difference in color. And also on the other side over here of the backsplash. So these colors, you can think to yourself, well, they're not really that important, but if you wanna do something for uh, designers and architects, th th they just wouldn't go for it. This is just not professional quality. And also if you wanna do luxury properties, then you're gonna be able to have an edge by showing something like this. When you show a flambient shot like this, it just doesn't compare to what somebody would do here. You look like a professional photographer when you take something that looks like this. So while HDR can be very tempting because it doesn't take you much time on site, the overall amount of time is high. And that's where it's the illusion, this myth that you can do HDR much quicker, but that only holds true if you don't do your own editing. That means that you have to outsource your editing and you have to rely on then your overseas editors to stay consistent, be there for you, and not fall off. So there's a, a reliance on your business model for these editors to do that. And it also means that these editors have to basically stay at the poverty level. I know that a lot of outsourcing can be justified by saying that, well, it's great money for them in their country, but basically, if you are relying on outsourcing your editing for a dollar a photo to somebody in India or Vietnam, you're basically exploiting poverty. Set the ethics aside for a minute. What this does rely, though, is on your business model that you have to ensure that your editors stay at that very low poverty level and can stay consistent. It's really not a sustainable business model. But putting all that aside, put the outsourcing aside for just a second. Think about this. You still have to be able to compete in your market by just being another photographer. So what that means is your competitiveness in your market, if you just do the average stuff, HDR is just average stuff, amateur plus maybe at best. That means that your competition and the way that you're gonna compete is through price in what I've always called the race to the bottom. It means you have to be lower priced than everybody else. Now, that means that if you can keep your editors at the poverty level and not paying them very much, then you can run around to a lot of houses. And is that really what you wanna to do to begin with? Uh, you know, for, for your business as a real estate photographer, you know, also it only means that you'll just be in that listing market where the results can just be okay. On the other hand, if you use pro techniques like Flambient, which I show in my books, I show in my online course, I show in different videos here. By the way, I've got links down in the description of this video for all that material. Using those pro techniques with Flambient, every single time you get high quality results, you don't have to then rely on a time burden being placed somewhere else and reliant on editors to be able to encompass and, and take care of that time burden for you. And you can also then expand into other markets because you have a higher competitive edge. You're not just another average photographer shooting real estate with the exact same results. You have something that's stunning, something that stands out, and that's what leads into other type of work. So not just the real estate listing market, but also architects, builders, designers, stagers, magazines. And technically speaking, you'll always have better results incorporating some type of flash into your work. And that's where Flambient comes in and makes it very easy. If all you're doing is HDR, even this modern HDR, which essentially is just nothing more than exposure blending using luminosity masks, 
it really relies on nothing but ambient light, which has a couple problems. One, you're not going to get consistent colors. We've been able to see that, and there's a lot of color correction that has to go into that. You're also going to get a much softer image because ambient light is much softer than flashlight. So flashlight has a higher contrast to it. And sharpness, by its very nature of physics, is nothing but just contrast. So sharpness and contrast run hand in hand. So the more contrast you have, then the sharper the image is overall. Just by nature, it becomes then more impactful. And another one that's really often overlooked by HDR photographers is the ability, if you were to use flash, to place flash where you want. This is real common, like for instance using shower pops. I can decide to put flash inside of a shower and get a much more impactful image than if I just tried to blend ambient images together. So you can get very creative on where you put light, and this is very critical if you're going to work outside of the listing market. Now, high-end listings, yes, they will want to see $100,000 bathrooms, $50,000 bathrooms, to be able to make them pop, including that shower. But there's all kinds of stuff where when you're working for architects, you're working for designers, builders, remodel companies, where they want to be able to highlight certain features and ambient light alone is not going to get you there. And of course, one of the big obvious ones, going through the examples, was the window pulls. Now, using Flambient, most of the exposure to the window is already there when you go to using your flash shot. And when you do a darken mode window pull, it doesn't matter if there's a whole bunch of little window panes or there's something blocking the window, curtains or anything else. Darken mode window pull in a snap gets you there, but if you were to use just this modern HDR or even the older HDR, you gotta cut in those windows. And yeah, everybody will show you the great examples where nothing's blocking the window, but that's just rarely the case. So in the real world, even in the especially in the listing market. So that's where the darken mode window pulls using Flambient come in and makes life so much easier and your workflow a lot faster. So we all know that social media tends to see life through rose-colored glasses, showing only the best of what could ever be. So when we see stuff shared on social media, we have to always question it and think, is it real or is somebody only showing me part of the story? And while what I was able to show here was my view of it, my take of it, and from my experience using it, this is something where you can now take an educated decision and try this yourself. See how well this works for you? With different cases, not just the best of the best, but various situations you might encounter, try them, see them, and see what works best for you. And then you can make a decision of what's best for you and your photography business going forward.